You are listening to Ultra Q, episode 25. My name is Red. I am joined by Mel. Hey, uh, coming to have a chat. All right, nice comfy table. <laughs> yeah. And me, uh, editing Red, Red from the future. I'll be popping in later to correct myself on the subject of Japan's history with opium. Um, it's, you know, involved. Um, coming up, cop justice, uh, the dangers of cigarettes and the 1998 movie Small Soldiers. Um, but first, uh, before we get into Ultra 7, uh, I have done nothing but uh, play Final Fantasy XIV <laughs> since <laughs> since Tuesday when we re-recorded uh, Ultra Q. Um, I have a new segment. Okay. Uh, because I You're found out... Too. I, I found out this is this is an informal this is an informal bit, but it's gonna it's gonna keep coming back. I did some investigating and I found out who my enemy is. Okay. Uh, a man named Michael Christopher Koji Fox, um, who is the trans the guy in charge of translating Final Fantasy fourteen and also Final Fantasy sixteen. <clears throat> um, and uh, I found out he is infamous or famous, depending on who you ask. To me, infamy. So I have a new segment called "The Crimes of Koji Fox." Uh, okay. We have a new we have a new crime this week. Uh, we have <laughs> <clears throat> we have so there are things in Final Fantasy fourteen called leave quests or left quests. I don't know how no one has pronounced it yet. There's been no voice acting basically, which has been they're very called, convenient uh, for me. They're called leave quests because I see what I have to do and then I leave. Yeah. <laughs> um. <clears throat> And there was one that was about barley and was about how because there were there are like something to do with uh, pe- people won't buy barley like that there's like a production limit on barley or something um, and you know you have to do like a fetch quest uh, related to barley um, the law is barely, is, like, very lightly mentioned. Kind of. In this quest description. So, Mel, what unhinged name did Koji Fox give this quest about Bali? Uh... A man who doesn't understand what a pun really is. (laughs) Blarly? I don't know. (laughs) He called it Bali Legal. Which, now, that is a bizarre thing to reference. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Mr. Fox, what are you doing? (laughs) Wait, why why is the title, like, a a pun on Bali Legal? Why? (laughs) Why? What the quest? What, the quest doesn't have anything to do with the age of consent. I don't think you know what a joke is, Koji Fox. What? Why would I you don't, do that? I don't. In all right, the reason that many puns come pre-packaged with their setup is that they need a fucking setup because otherwise it's do- it doesn't work. <laughs> you can't just say, "Oh, that sounds like this," and it be a joke because it's not relevant. It's not related. Um, that's it. That's my section this week. 
Um, uh, you know what? You're right. He is a criminal. <laughs> he's a criminal. <laughs> uh, so, um, what you been up to? Oh, uh, okay. Um, oh, whoa, that was a uh oh. <laughs> uh, that's a heavy okay. I was just disappointed that <laughs> all this time and you for- pushed yourself through Final Fantasy fourteen. <laughs> I okay. I have uh been having a decent enough time uh going through terrible quest lines while watching VTuber streams. Okay, that um, probably helps. I've been watching I've been catching up on some old uh Pomu and Selen streams that I uh had been meaning to get around to for a while. Uh, because the energy is villainous. It's great. Um, uh, but yeah, that's that's also the friends at the table. Um, although I really, I what I really need it to be, uh, absolutely like brain dead content in Final Fantasy fourteen for me to manage to pay attention to friends at the table. Yeah, yeah that's, invo- to, that's, like, in, that's involved. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 my problem with like me trying to get into friends at the table because you know as an actual play podcast it fits in a similar space as like audiobooks where i'm like i can't just be passive and like do the other stuff in the same way like i am mm-hmm. podcasts uh and mm-hmm. it's like be more actively listening so yeah it's true. it's um it's frustrating but um yeah it is what it is uh i'll get back so... i'll back i'll try again at friends at the table at some point because you know i do want to get into it mm-hmm. just you know uh yeah it's 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 good i'm enjoying partisan so far um did you start from the beginning or oh i or how, or i think i started you? from counterweight okay um and then to be honest i should re-listen to counterweight because i didn't i couldn't distinguish between a couple of people's voices in counterweight but i could after i had listened to like autumn in higher on um yeah i think i tried a bit of autumn in higher on uh, a couple months ago and didn't get very far and if i was like mm-hmm. well I, I think i have to re- actually re-listen to these episodes <laughs> even uh, mm-hmm. so um but yeah i've listened to i think everything except for mm, spring and higher on i think that's the one i'm missing okay um which is uh, bizarre because that's like a direct it's it's the end of a trilogy <laughs> I should really listen to it. Um, but, uh, yeah. Shame there was uh, no summer. Uh, shame, uh, shame there's no summer. Um, no, nah, I'm, I'm a summer hater. I've always, I've That's always, true. I've always been a summer hater. Like there's, there's been times back, you know, back before summer was like objectively hell. Um, uh, and people would be like, oh, you're complaining about the heat now, but you'll be complaining about the cold when it's winter. I was like, nope, doesn't happen. <laughs> it's not true. Yeah, I, I prefer it. With cold in winter, I just complain about the heat more. Hmm. Um. Well. Uh. Now I managed to squeeze a few extra minutes out of the fact that I only played Final Fantasy fourteen. There you go. There I I like um I'm I started on like Lancer um and uh, the Dragoon opening quest. The, the, for unlocking Dragoon is in a place that I haven't been to yet and I felt like uh, I was getting introduced to a thing early and so I was like well, I'm gonna stall on this until I get to it in like the story quest or whatever um, and so I've been leveling up uh, Marauder and Paladin um, because I want to get tanks I want to be know how to do how to do tanking before I unlock Dark Knight which I want to play Dark Knight because I'm cringe. Um, I'm. I gotta be honest with you. The thing I want to do if I ever go far enough in FF14 is play Sage, so I can be a Gundam. Oh yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. The the thing. So I I do want to play Sage, but the thing is that that's Endwalker, and that's yeah, that's too far. Like away. level. That's like level eighty. Um, <laughs> that's have... like that's that's like five JRPGs worth of time uh-huh. to get there. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, um. Are they even good JRPGs worth? Time will tell. <laughs> Time will tell. <laughs> so far, uh, no. Oh. Um, the very boring quest lines. Um, uh, I, you know. Also, uh, hates women. Um, but, uh, you know, 
I'm I'm getting through it. Um, I mean, I like the so I like uh, tanking. It turns out, but I I have yet to try it multiplayer. So that's the that's that's the real test. <laughs> Um, it's good that I like tanking because Dark Knight is the one that I really want to play. That's how it works. That's how it works. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. But uh, if eventually, I say eventually, I will. You have to, okay, this podcast will hold me to this. You have to hold me to this. I have to get back to playing Final Fantasy 2 and also Dragon's Dogma. <laughs> I, need to, yeah, I need to finish FF six at some point if if i come back next week and i say all i've done is play final fantasy 14 i have to get kicked off the show it has it has to be that level of threat uh but i mean <laughs> you edit this show i don't know if i can do that <laughs> uh well okay i it has to be uh i don't know i have to be shamed publicly otherwise it's never gonna happen uh so I, I will be I will be accountable this will be my accountability i have to do something else other than final fantasy 14 this week yeah Um, so, uh, I, I, five minutes later, I ask again, what you've been up to? <laughs> okay. Uh, got a couple things I'll go through quickly and then one, uh, more sizable thing, which might not be as long, but we'll see. Uh, one, I finished, uh, another audiobook, uh, the 1992 cyberpunk novel Snow Crash. Mm-hmm. And I think it was terrible, so I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, extremely the best parts of the book was when it was basically the protagonist reading wikipedia pages on mesopotamia and linguistics uh and mm-hmm. uh, in hindsight i realize uh those are only enjoyable to me because i also would read those wikipedia pages uh, but they <laughs> actually make for a good narrative and meanwhile the actual narrative uh is eye-rolling and unremarkable at best and at worst uh repugnant and vile and so it is just uh not worth anyone's time is uh, oh man. also i think it is the book that coined the term net metaverse uh which means it is evil oh no oh no that's um that's uh <laughs> it's funny in like the um the like hall of fame cyberpunk novels that you've got like um william gibson to- coining like terms like like net or something um and uh which is just like yeah that's just normal that's just uh, everyone everyone just talks everyone talks about it like that um and then you've got uh snow crash ah metaverse is like no okay, to, be cursed. Right, think, to be fair i think snow crash also coined the term avatar but uh oh it's a bit more oh. yeah uh, which is also unfortunate because the, the book is really bad it's so bad <laughs> The protagonist is called Hero Protagonist. I'm uh, yeah. I have think the th- thing. This is the thing that I have known about Snow Crash for for a very long time. Is that everything is like very tongue in. There's like a. It's all like supposedly like very tongue in cheek. Like everything's a corporation, and yeah, also the main so, character is called Hero Protagonist. Yeah, and so it like the, the, delivers pizza or something. Yeah, the setup seems to be like tongue in cheek, but like it still wants Hero to be a cool protagonist who is the best sword fighter. Uh, and everything else is like all right rolling and also while it is being like tongue-in-cheek satirical cyberpunk the stuff where it's like anyway the stuff about language and can you hack the brain and unlock the secrets of the mind is done in earnest uh and is in service of ultimately doing an evangelion <laughs> let's uh, go <laughs> instrumentality plot and it's just like okay, what are we doing? let's go when did this book come out 1992 <laughs> Oh, oh. Let's get in the line. Let's get in the uh, line. All right. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's it's, that's funny. It's, it's not good. Uh, I will I will be spending my time on other books probably in the near future. Uh, mm-hmm. Not that not that this one I think has any sequels, but you know, uh, I just think I'm gonna. I'm just I'm just gonna. Like, you know what? I don't think I'm gonna look at anything else by this author. To be honest, it's it's long too, isn't it? Snow Crash. It was it was a pretty lengthy. I mean, I'm, I'm I mostly I read do books via audiobooks these days, just because you know it's easier for me to mm-hmm. consume audio than words, which is why it's still taking a long time for me to pick away <laughs> three kingdoms. Oh, it's it's like yeah, I'm it's, I it's I, like, it's, I like bit, it's like five hundred pages. Snow Crash. Yeah, I read I read a bit more three kingdoms, and I'm 
really close to the point. I'm pretty sure where Kong Ling shows up. Really close. Let's, yes. <laughs> I saw you posting about, about Liu Bei, um looking up how to unlock, how to uh, complete character quests or something. <laughs> Good and, good. and getting and getting some guy responding. Yeah, that's good. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I'll get more of an update later when I actually get to Kong Ling. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I've also went through the entire Project Echo movie slash OVA series. Mid. Yeah, you just cut you cut straight through it <laughs> right away. I was just gonna say like, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. This is kind of the vibe I've I've been getting. <laughs> um, yeah. If you if you want my full thoughts on Project Echo, uh, I would direct you to like ten episodes ago when I talked about Bubblegum Crisis because it's basically the same. <laughs> <story>. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, this is you know nice aesthetic, really well animated thing brought to you by the people who consume anime and <laughs> the writing reflects that because there's kind of nothing um Damn. the basic premise is that uh there's Aiko who's like a girl who is strong uh Biko who is like the rich girl who is jealous of her uh, wait and Siko. They, they're actually like abc that's cool <laughs> yeah and Siko, who's like the really obnoxious i do not like her cute moi blob who is sort of like the nexus point of their love triangle kind of oh i see uh i just found them a slog to get through uh mm-hmm. somehow i erroneously thought that like the fourth one was the best one because it made my neurons flatline less but i don't think that's probably uh, it probably isn't actually the best one uh it's me and C destiny <laughs> Um, the first one is like an actual theatrical movie so it has like the best budget animation uh, the rest are like OVAs which uh, you know the trade off is that like uh, if you are enjoying the movie that's fine but if you aren't enjoying it you do have to sit through it for like 84 minutes mm-hmm. as opposed to the OVAs which are like 50 minutes which makes them a bit more yeah tolerable uh, yeah, that's that, that if if you're like you know enjoying them and not insane like me and just <laughs> going yeah, through just them. Just go bored. deciding to watch. It's like, well, I started, so yeah. I guess I'll finish. I could I could have tapped out any point, uh, but I didn't, and uh, I don't know why. I was just like, yeah, I'm gonna do this. I don't enjoy this, but I'm still gonna do it to say I did uh, it. Classic. Um, yeah, the third one for whatever reason they introduce. The, they make it so that Aiko and Biko start liking a guy instead, and Seiko gets jealous. Uh, and the guy likes Seiko. But, and, okay. but the guy is also not a character. And I think that's part of the joke, but also it's like. still the core of the plot. And <laughs> so it's. Yeah, I, don't know, so it's I still. I, you know, I, very funny joke, guys. I now still have to watch the show. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like, you know. Uh, It it is like damn. You could have just had something where the girls like each other, but no. Uh, Biko does like to build giant robots to harass Aiko, which is fun. Even more so that her dad also likes to build giant robots and steals her own robots. He is he's fun enough. Uh, there's like aliens coming, and like the world state does progressively evolve with each one, so that's fine. I'm struggling to find more to say. <laughs> I, th- I, th- I think ki- it's kind of nothing yeah it is it's extremely nothing it's just like yeah this is people who like anime making their own anime that looks nice uh but it's like probably carried more by references than like substance from a writing perspective like oh. yeah sure it looks nice but you know all uh, flash rizless gynax yeah probably um yeah, I, I I feel like this is just like a bubblegum crisis scenario where it's like it was one of the first ones that came over in like the 80s. And so yeah. it has it was, it, it's a big cachet here. from its like legacy just be like, oh yeah, this is a cool thing because I've never seen anime before and now I've seen... It also got that big uh, boost from... Uh discotech like rescuing it or something yeah yeah because it was like they were gonna um, do an up but then they found the masters by accident 
Yeah. And which so is like, like a, a, which is like you know it's cool. Uh, it's, yeah, which, it's, which it's cool. I'm not. Good. I'm not going to be dismissive of of that. Um, but also, it was very funny seeing all of that. Like, oh man, we found the original, and you know, we can get like a really, really, really cool version of this out for people to buy, um, like officially. Um, and then you know, be like, is it good? No, nah. <laughs> not really. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is very funny to me. I. It was one of those things where it's like, I think I bought into FOMO, so I was, uh, I, if it wasn't for the fact I was Canadian, I would have bought it on right stuff for a reasonable price, but of course I'm Canadian, so right Can't. stuff is too expensive yeah. for me to buy things on. Uh, but I think it worked out in the end, because, you know, I just, you know, got the discotheque release through other means. Uh, uh, what? what, what, what? <laughs> uh, and, you know. How could you? <laughs> Ultra 7's Ultra coming. He's a cop now. Oh, uh, he was always a cop. <laughs> yeah, he was always a cop. He was always a cop. Uh, but yeah, uh, <coughs> extremely well, that just happened. Mm-hmm. Well, that's unfortunate. Yeah. But oh well. Yeah. You've watched it now. You can say you've watched it. Yeah, and that can that's worth it, it right? Uh, <laughs> 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 I mean, I guess I can't make... Uh, I guess I can't criticize you for FF14 in this case. Uh, well, yes, you can. This is oh. way more hours of my life. <laughs> and you know what? Yeah, yes. Um. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the other thing. Oh shoot. Uh, <laughs> would you? I hadn't, me I hadn't I realized there was another thing. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, would you believe me if I said I, uh, <laughs> there's another sentence and I say <laughs> You've already finished it. Are you no. joking? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is. Uh, that would have been crazy. That would have been insane. Uh, that one I'm still like two episodes in. Okay. Um, okay. Oof. This is a separate one. <laughs> this is a group watch. Uh, so we're not doing the game either. It's like separate. Uh, so, if you remember last week, I was talking about 80 Sentai. <laughs> so uh, I have brought for you today an 80 Sentai. Okay. Uh, Shodenshi Bioman, the nineteen eighty four Sentai series. Ooh, I I am uh, looking at this opening right now. Damn, the vibe is. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's got the vibe of the eighties. It it's does. Extremely here. Uh, this is this just, is uh, this is this is just making me think. Oh, holy shit! <laughs> yes. Uh. This when when I think of like peak eighties energy, I always think of like the old guy mopey. Um, yeah, this this is similar vibe. This um, is very much in that region. Damn. Uh, so yeah, so Chodenshi Bioman is uh the third in a row out of nine in a series written by Hirohisa Soda. <laughs> uh, okay, a guy who would write a bunch of sentai uh and then in the 90s early aughts go to i guess write capcom games because he also wrote code veronica and the onimusha games um uh and so this is kind of like a, his so the first five seasons of sentai were written by shoza uahara our good friend on this podcast he's done some awesome uh, stuff oh okay cool uh, I have forgotten what he's done. In fact, he might he may even come up later this episode. <laughs> even, uh, but yeah, the first two first two Sentai were under Ishinomori, uh, then Spider Man happened, then the next two three seasons were kinda Marvel related, uh Marvel Co productions, but Chosa Hurara were all five of them. Then Soda came on and from what I have been told, I watched this with my friend Katia who knows more about this era of toku um the show after the first five so his first show goggle five was apparently still kind of feeling like a uh, uahara show just because he was kind of thrown on the last minute yeah. okay still kind of figuring out uh his next show dynaman was i guess him finding his footing um and also aired alongside space sheriff gabon which was a big hit 
And so this is like a show that's like Soda, I think, first his first show where he's like starts doing his own thing and starts to take the Sentai in a new direction. Uh it's inspired by the Robot Romance trilogy in terms of writing style, which Let's go. I see Voltez and I see it go, yeah, I see it. <laughs> um King like, of Haters, Prince Heinel. Uh it's got it's got similar energy. Um, I think it's it's the first it's I've heard that like this is so does like with the first right where he's like he's starting to like do more plot stuff in Sentai and add more of that in. Uh, I think the character mm-hmm. so you got your five guys who to be honest are kind of more archetypes than like fully fleshed out characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got. Go, who's like the hero guy, who's red one. You have Shingo and Nanbara, who are green two and blue three, respectively, and they are the two guys. <laughs> uh, I it took me to like two thirds of the show to remember to memorize the blue guy's name. Uh, Hikaru is the pink, uh, and the most interesting one. At the start is the yellow Mika, who's kind of like a biker girl, who is a bit more of a rogue. Uh, Ooh, cool. Uh, until, unfortunately, at some point early in production, her she just leaves the industry and disappears. Oh, no. uh, so they kill her off her character. <laughs> no! <laughs> uh, and uh, replace her with uh, Jun, who is like this uh, tomboy girl who's an Olympic archer girl. <laughs> um, well... Who you probably saw in the opening? I uh, yeah. Uh, I guess I I guess we haven't lost completely. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it's, they got the job done. And to be clear, I think the actors are doing a good job. It's just like the writing isn't necessarily like. And and, and to be clear, it's not, it's not like I think it's not like I think like Soda's doing a bad job. It's just like you know, different expectations. He's like yeah, it's know. it's 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 bare bones. It's not like, you know. The thing, the things that it's inspired by aren't like, you know, we, we like we like Walters Five, uh, but a lot of those characters aren't real, aren't like super characters, like th- yeah. they're just kind of yeah, and got like their thing, and that's what they do. And like one thing is like everyone and ev- all the actors seem to know martial arts, which is cool. Like they just a lot, there's a lot oh, of cool. suit fighting, so you know, there's good action, there's good sets yeah. in the show. Um, uh, the the premise is that uh, like five hundred years ago, uh, there was a planet bio that exploded, uh, and then uh, the ro- the mecha bio robo who I should uh, you've seen in the OP I think the big mecha yeah 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 uh, and Peebo the gold robot um, come to Earth and then give some random people bioparticles and the descendants are able to have bio power to become bio man. I don't know where, where bio comes from. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the theming of the show does seem to be more like electronics and generic science as is typical of the era. Um, the villains are not from space at all. Uh, there's a guy called Dr. Man uh, and everyone, <laughs> his, his henchmen all salute him by saying for the man. Uh, and he's just this evil scientist who's turned himself into a cyborg, and he has this army of mecha humans. Uh, and the show does something different. Well, one notable: this is the first season with two female rangers, so that's cool. Um, that is cool. Uh, second, the the monsters of the week are all strictly kaiju, um, because and instead you have like uh, Doctor Man's like gang of like generals and underlings as more like recurring villains who are up to the episodic plots and so mm-hmm. there's more like more so happening between like each of the villains the uh, the main three are mason who is a generic guy villain uh farah who is you know the female villain mm. which you know you know what that archetype too uh yeah 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 uh, and then monster who is the big guy um, mm-hmm and there's some other guys like 
there's some other unknown. I don't remember all the names. There's one guy called Sigorn whose most notable features are one, he has three faces, and two, every time he shows up, he says Sigorn. <laughs> Good. Uh, Good. Um, and yeah, this is sort of like doing the Sentai thing. Uh, there's a new, there's a weird thing going on every week. Uh, what are those guys up to? Oh, we gotta stop it. Uh, and like partway through the like partway through the show the show starts i think doing more interesting stuff and sort of like plot at least with the villain side uh they introduce that like there's a robot version there's a robot who's like called prince who's supposed to be dr man's son and then like you know they kill him but then there's like a real kid named shuichi who looks like prince and is this dr man's real son and what does this mean about dr man's humanity um and then you get he's called dr man yeah. <laughs> called dr man but really hates the fact that he's human <laughs> yeah. uh um you get stuff near the end of the show about like go's dad and how he had a past relationship with dr man uh leading to a funny thing where he turned himself into a cyborg <laughs> and it's just like oh this i had to turn myself into a cyborg it was the only way <laughs> uh one of the more fun additions in the last third is like um you talk about how bio planet was destroyed by the anti-bio faction uh and like there's this like i mean looking a picture of him uh this guy called bio hunter silva who's like this cool bounty hunter guy who exists only to like defeat the um used to play a lot of halo on machinima yeah he exists only to like beat the um bio man he doesn't really care about dr man at all but he's just like he, he he's, like, he's like he's like his own third faction um he looked nice really oh sick. this guy's cool yeah he looks sick um like there's him. a part where it's a bit of a hole oh, oh, like... that's not a, that's not a weapon that's from his that's just his elbows yes Oh, that's cool! Every, every time a, he gets ready to fight, spike the spikes coming come out. from yeah, coming from his wrist and going flaring out from his elbows. That's yeah, he, sick. He does this thing where like he's just like he'll be like standing there and like knocking his um pistol against his shoulder, uh, and he's just like cool guy. Yeah, like there's a part where like in the there's the holding pattern where they're like not yet in the end game where like he sometimes just like. The plot is completely unrelated to him, but he'll just show up and be like, hey, I'm still here, and then interrupt the fight, and then the the fight ends, and then the show moves on to the next scene, and it gets kind of funny. Um, but it gets more cool in like, the last stretch, where it's like, he's trying to find like his own mecha, and the villains also want that mecha for their own purposes, and you know, there's a big like three-way fight going on between the, the Bioman, Silva, and you know, the villains. Uh, and it's cool. And on the subject of the mecha, there's only like the one guy, the Biorobo, who is like a friend. Um, but the way, like, just seeing like the Robo come out, like the vehicles and stuff, just. I feel like I should have realized this sooner. But it didn't take. It took me until like seeing it in 80s Sentai to sort of like get it. And maybe it's also alongside this podcast. But I was like, shit. There is kind of a bunch of Ultraman just in Sentai, if you think about it. Mm-hmm. Because you got a squad of guys. Uh, there's a weird thing happening every week because of some kind of monster. And then, like, the last three minutes is, like, there's a kaiju battle with, like, a... Mm-hmm. Not, not Silverman in this case, but, like, a Robo. Um, yeah. I think it also helps in, like in this earlier era in like the 80s and 90s uh the robos are like <laughs> uh nice picture as it uh oh my god <laughs> middle, middle of the conversation yeah right, there he is uh nice shades um yeah but yeah um i think the mecha fights in so like I've seen like more modern Sentai a lot, and I wasn't that impressed by the mecha in those ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I feel like watching like eighties and nineties ones. I'm, I feel like they, they feel matter more. more. Cool. Yeah, they, yeah, they're less ancillary. Like this, is like the thing they do at the end of the episode when there's like three minutes left. But like, mm-hmm. 
it feels like more impactful and like it's just the fights are cooler and i think part of it's like the robots aren't as clunky and over designed and overly toyetic and just like ancillary uh i think there's like a level of dynamism to the fights you can get just when the robot is just a guy you know yeah more more simple um and this look how it holds through for jetman and some other 90s stuff i've seen uh and also just you know you know just jetman had like the jets kind of like the VTOLs, and the jets became the robots kind of thing so i'm just kind of seeing like the thunderbirds to ultraman See, to super simple yeah. pipeline the, uh, the through the through line um that takes uh from yeah. from thunderbirds through to uh hero gary sky pre <laughs> yeah and that, that, that's why i like when i started the other series that we picked for the game last week i sent you well, i started the first episode and like i sent you the picture of those vehicles immediately just because like oh wait, you can kind of see yes when presented like this just kind of like kind of like the miniatures mm. and it's just it's just cool um it gives me more of an appreciation for it and then i i made a tweet joking about this like yo you know if you think about it sentai is a lot like ultraman and then like one of my mutuals my recent mutuals uh, was just like yeah it's almost like the guy who wrote the first seasons of sentai also wrote on ultraman i was like shit <laughs> you're right <laughs> nice nice uh, what do we know do we know what he's written on ultraman have we seen anything from him yet shows are her yeah uh i have let me just uh double check let me go back um because i had it somewhere he wrote like two episodes in ultra q and two episodes in ultraman uh but i think i saw that he also wrote a bunch of uh he's well i looked him up i I think i think he has a lot of credits on ultra seven actually okay you know what i won't talk about it right now uh because he has written an episode we're talking about today so uh okay I'll, i'll just we'll talk about what episodes he did for in the past that we covered when we get to him yeah uh but yeah just it is it is the kind of thing where it's like oh yeah when you put it that way and like the first two you know the first two sentai seasons were like ishinomori creative control so we like even though Uruha was writing it i'm sure like ishinomori had more of like the final say and like the original impetus of sentai was like without the robots and it came more out of like ishinomori going like what if common rider but there was five of them and that's like a go ranger mm-hmm. uh but then it's you know they take this hiatus uh they do spider-man and then they spider-man as a robot they include the robot and i think that's where like the robot they start folding in more of like i guess uruhara starts like doing more of like his ultraman stuff toei's toei spider-man has a robot yes that's cool yeah the the robot is entirely is is the robot in toei spider-man is why sentai has mechs basically oh that's cool yeah uh but yeah uh Bioman, it's kind of, kind of. I'll, I'll give you a better. Yo, actually, you know, what? uh, this reminds me. Uh, this, I think this, the eighties, Sentai also gave me an appreciation for, uh, why they have Sentai movies, because you know, okay, I've mostly seen like mostly, I've seen Sentai movies for recent shows, which means mm-hmm. which are usually like half an hour. Uh, double building with Santa, the Kamen Rider movies, which are actual movies. Right. Like an hour. And so it just feels like a glorified episode, especially when I'm watching them on my laptop uh, at the same resolution. Yeah, rather than as like a yeah. as like a, like a a pre-feature. Yeah, and rather than like, oh yeah, I'm going to the theater and seeing it, which, you know, if you're a kid, going to see your favorite guys at the theater would be sick. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, you know, watching the Bioman movie, uh, which is like, you know, First, it's like 40 minutes, so it's you know, a bit more lengthy. But also, it was like... It's still a bit like the plot is just a glorified episode. So it's like, you know how it is with like anime movies, too. It's like, you know, pre movies mm, are like this. Yeah, too. I mean, you know, uh, I also watched the pre-kill movies and went, I don't get it. <laughs> but, like, because, you know, I'm, I'm sat on my bed with a laptop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but... See, the difference is... Uh, I see the file and the resolution and go... 
oh yeah in the 80s and i guess true today too when you're filming things uh for a tv you're using different film than for a movie and you're using the better film for the movie so i'm watching a four by three standard definition show uh but the movie is like 16 by 9 and they're using the better effects looks and really film. good <laughs> and it looks even better when it's like opera and that's why i'm going to send you two comparison photos in the chat damn and yeah it's just like oh yeah that's that's why you see go see the movie uh let me find like another screenshot because it's just the, the movie does look good and it's just like if you're just watching the show you only get to see like this like kind of like you know mm-hmm. sd blurry version i mean you know it's like it's you know it's of the era but like it's kind of cool just like seeing be, like, obviously if they bring a character back and use the suit again it's like yeah that's a one way of seeing it in high definition but it's kind of cool seeing something of the time that looks so well good uh here's another mm-hmm. shot from the movie where they're just going all out with the explosions oh sick yeah uh it's cool um yeah it's just like it's definitely like it's simple like this is the this is the start of sentai trying to be more plot stuff but like you know it's, it's the stop def- yeah it's also you know it's, it's still good like it's not like a bad show uh by any means it's very good i i recommend it uh i'm looking forward to more shows of the era uh it's a different style you know and like this is supposed to be like this and then like the next five shows this and the four shows of fall wet that soda did are like just the high watermark of 80 sentai so i'm looking forward to them uh just cool aesthetic it's, it's a different aesthetic the way the suits look which is interesting um very science mm-hmm. um very science they, they do have a super move at the end near the end of the show called super electron where they're just like all right guys time to go super and i think it's just with the equivalent of oh we're more powerful now <laughs> which is funny uh you know how it is i know how it is uh it's it's fun it's good food but yeah super sentai it's nice. good i'm make, making my way through more seasons uh yeah um damn you're uh, way more productive than me this week <laughs> yeah I, I i i i yeah i didn't want to yeah i could have probably done more but i also just didn't do more i just had other stuff no no no, no worries don't worry yeah, we, we um all right well sentai covered this is this ain't a sentai podcast this is an Ultraman podcast. So let's talk about Ultra 7. Um, Ultra 7? Yeah. Not an Ultraman podcast anymore. Ultra 7 podcast. Um, there's only one Ultraman show in the first three Ultra shows. And now and now there's like a billion Ultraman shows. Yeah. They should have... Now, this is maybe controversial. It would... If they had kept up being ultra something else, that might have been cool. Uh, but, we know. might we might talk about that a bit in a future season. Yeah. Um, yeah, Return of Ultraman. Uh, yes, but also uh, one. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, well, episode seven of Ultra Seven. Uh, which should now, if I was making Ultra Seven, I would make Episode Seven a really good episode. Um, they made it an episode. Um, yeah, which is the unfortunate. Of the bunch. Yeah, uh, weakest of the bunch. Space Prisoner Three O Three. On board Thunderbird Five, decoding expert Mizuno uh, receives multiple transmissions from an alien source, but has been unable to decipher them. Meanwhile. Two hunters find a tiny spaceship in the woods and are attacked by an alien. Uh, this alien attacks a gas station, uh, killing Ipe. Rip. Oh, pretty. Yeah, and drinking gas straight from the hose. Um, the Ultra Guard attempt to track down the culprit of these murders. Uh, Mizuno deciphers the message from earlier, which are from a distant planet called uh, Kuras. Uh, and in a complete non-twist... It turns out that the monster is a murderous fug- fugitive escaped from prison. Um, this is treated like a reveal. It was very funny. 
Um, the Ultra Guard think they have the Fugitive cornered, uh, but he escapes by kidnapping Anne and hypnotizing her. Uh, he has her sneak him into the Ultra Guard base, where they then hijack one of the three ships that make up Ultra Hulk 1. Um, Dan comes up with a daring rescue plan. Uh, use the other two parts of Ultra Hawk 1 and dock with the fugitive ship. Uh, this plan works, mostly, and Anne is rescued. Uh, but Dan is stuck on the ship with the alien when the other two parts separate. Uh, as it crashes, Dan turns into Ultra 7 to survive. Uh, the fugitive grows to huge size, but Ultra 7 turns back into Dan and tells the guard to back up. The alien is essentially a gas tank, and he's currently on fire. Um, as the alien screams in the flames, Dan says... There's nowhere left to run. Whether it's Earth or space, justice is the same. And then the alien explodes. Back at base, the Ultra Guard receive a message of thanks from the planet uh, Curasso, uh, and the squad thinks this might be a good chance to open up friendly negotiations with an alien species. Uh, the end. Bro, cold. <laughs> uh, Seven, Dan has just said like the most cold ass shit to this guy as he's on fire. It's, it is um simultaneously uh uh evil and also kind of cool it's yes. like <laughs> it's uh it's a uh, a hard line like it's you know um he's ma massive massive cop energy off this episode um i mean yes uh, yes is, literally it's not even like subtext cop is like this is just no the text of the yes episode. <laughs> yes we we are the cops we're the we're the space cops uh we're, well we're the earth cops we're dealing with space criminals um, the, uh, the decoding thing, again, complete non-twist. It's not a reveal. <laughs> He's already been killing people. What are you talking about? Um, just a, uh, a very Ipe. strange addition. Uh, killed Ipe. Yeah, Ipe comes, uh, comes back. He's, a uh, he works at the gas station. Um, uh, <laughs> the, oh, god. Uh, when, when the woman comes to the gas station two points one uh she was honking because like there was an attendant and that's for part where i wrote my notes uh white woman uh -huh. can't her own gas. <laughs> <laughs> um I knew, I knew it was coming <laughs> uh next part um she comes in and like talks to like call a gas attendant uh and i'm just like her voice so caught me off guard. Right. I just started laughing. <laughs> it's, it has to be dubbed. It has to be. It's I think I think so... I read somewhere that like, as a standard practice of the time, they like, film the scenes without sound and then redub them later. Just mm -hmm. everyone, which just feels weird. But also, I think it explains yeah, why sometimes is, sometimes yeah. things seem a bit off when in terms of like, delivery. Mm. And that's that's that's, I, I that's kind of normal on some productions of this kind of time i think but yeah. um this this is so jarring this is like that's not her voice what are you talking about <laughs> um it's uh so uh it's like extremely high-pitched and um i was yeah uh wild but um the uh the bit where the kai the monster starts guzzling gas, the only thing I could think of is those uh, videos of the transforming anime girls, um, <laughs> with the with the one that's drinking gas straight from the hose, <laughs> uh, um, which was uh, very very cursed. But yeah. uh, I will say the 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 alien in this episode does have a a vibe to it that's like uh creepy mm -hmm. unsettling for mm -hmm. sure. yeah um the um tiny spaceship doesn't really come up much um like like obviously it can transport it can like change its size because that's um that's the deal they have to be able to do that because at the end of the episode they have to turn big and then explode um uh, but uh, it's uh, you know just not really commented on when like the the tiny spaceship uh, is like well that can't be a spaceship There's, no one could fit on that um, but presumably the prisoner was really tiny um, in the space in the tiny spaceship um, 
Like the Boltons. We, yeah, like the Boltons. But, you know, less innocent than the Boltons. Than uh, most of the Boltons. Yeah. There was, there, was that, there was that one Bolton who was like, we're going to conquer the Earth. Um, Guilty by association. Yeah. Every, everyone else snoozing. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. J- Jim, Jim said that he had it all in hand, that he had it sorted, so we're going to sleep. <laughs> uh, if Ultraman caught this alien, he would go to the planet. He would go to Planet Carasso and nuke him. He's like, guilty by association. Like, no, we we're trying to warn him. He's like, ah, oh, didn't didn't work. Guess guess the message about the negotiations later is just like, <sighs> he's just like, tucking his collar. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> awkward. What was the other thing you were gonna say? Um, I don't know. Um, it probably wasn't important. Um. You might come up mm. again. Uh, uh, I kind of wish more of the episode was focused on like the alien home invasion instead of like a single scene. Because I feel like that's like a it yeah. Could be cool, it was it was that that one bit of the episode is definitely like the highlight. I think um, it's uh, it's a scene that's you know it's it's got tension to it. It's yeah. um, it's got something going on. Yeah, like um, the, the kid upstairs it, just like gonna come down and sees the no, no don't and just like sneaks out the window and like mm-hmm. has to stop when like the the alien looks through the curtain and it's like it's good stuff going on yeah yeah uh, it it was also just like the build up was just very funny just like classic like oh it says there's a there's an alien on the loose and it's like we have we locked our doors it's like, oh don't worry about it and like a noise and it's like oh that's probably nothing and it's like oh we should go check the check the garage do you smell uh, gas <laughs> do you smell gas <laughs> that's so weird um i do think the plan to like oh he's in one of our planes we simply have to dock it with the other ones is uh cute that's big cool. brand i like it yeah that's cool um we should pull up uh, Razan's notes. Yes. Uh, let me find these pins. Do, do, do. Uh, Episode seven reactions. It is very uh, funny. Also, just <laughs> can I see? go ahead. Oh yeah, Ipe. First reaction: Ipe. All caps. Uh, you were saying? Oh yeah, I was. Just, um, it is funny how like the plane just crashes because it's on fire, and then everyone's like, "Dan, you're still alive." And it's like, "Oh yeah." Uh, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm good. Don't worry about me. Um, uh, Razan's other reactions to this episode. This alien is not that scary. Uh, but dear God, they are doing everything they can to make him feel like a monster. Yeah, the the home invasion stuff, especially, is like um, really trying to make this guy threatening. Yeah. It's, um, it's you know they, they do a pretty good job. Uh. Honestly, that's about it. Razan's other last note. Honestly, that's about it. I think it's cool this show is willing to ex- to explore alien-human relations, even when it's going full cop mode. It is very funny that in the most cop episode we've had so far, it is also the episode where friendly negotiations are opened up with the aliens. Yeah. <laughs> because we don't we don't have to look at them. We <laughs> it's fine. We don't have to confront the fact that they that they don't look like people. Um, yeah. The, the, they they look like uh, they look like aliens. Um, they, so they you know, it's uh yeah. Uh, the only the only guy that's allowed is uh, Pigmar. He's not in this uh, universe. And he's not in this universe. Uh, directed uh, by Toshitsugi Suzuki, uh, who directed Endless Counterattack uh, from um. Oh, and the Mephilus episode. Endless Counterattack is also Ultraman, right? I'm assuming that's what the implication. I'm just trying to remember which episode what it was. What is endless counterattack? Oh, it's it. um. Uh yeah, I got this thirty second episode of Ultraman. What's the thirty second episode? Oh, hang on. That's the one just before Raffles. Okay, some 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 info. Uh, for anyone listening to this, because this is ex- this is exclusively to you, our very small listener base. Um, if you type in anti before fandom on any fandom um, wiki, uh, you get a much more presentable version of the wiki. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, oh, it's the party episode. Oh, yeah, the whatever. Mm-hmm. So yeah. he, he did 
two episodes back to back, and one of those was a lot better than the other. <laughs> to be frank. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one of the all time uh, guys, and then uh, that one. That one. Yeah. <clears throat> Written by Tetsuo Kinjo. Oh, who's a name I recognize? He from, um, he's done all of these episodes. He's, I think, yeah. he's done most of the episodes of the show so far. Um, yeah. Um, Tetsuo Kinjo well, also did the Maples episode. Uh, cool. Uh, I don't have much more to say about uh, episode seven. I got of Ultra Seven. Go one ahead. more thing to say. Uh, Hit me. Because it's funny. Uh, so because Ultra Seven doesn't have a color timer, I haven't been given color timers for this show. However, uh, where the fuck are the capsule monsters? <laughs> well, okay, yeah, that too. Uh, uh, I don't know where they are. This, this my bum, my bit is uh, getting shot in the foot. But anyway, uh, I did want to take note of how long Ultra Seven is transformed, just because it's so funny how short he's transformed in this episode. It's really not it's very a, long. He transforms a, to survive a crash, and then is just like, "No, nah, I'm good. I don't need to a, do anything more." Based on my my my. He's, he's, he's transformed to 10 seconds. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. It's so funny. Perfect. That's what you need. I just, that's I just what need, you need. I need to note it just because, like, it's so short. It's so funny. Uh, it's perfect. Uh, sometimes Ultra 7 is not necessary. I think it, I think I appreciate uh, that. I bet you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of guys who think that uh, the Ultraman himself is maybe not necessary... Do you want to move on to episode eight? Oh, you mean the good Ultra episode? Seven. <laughs> Do you I mean the, the good, good fucking good episode. <laughs> um, if you are, on, if you skipped a lot of Ultraman um, to get to uh, the good, the the good good stuff to get to Ultra Seven, um, and you watched uh, episode eight of Ultra Seven and went, "Damn, this is this is a step up." Let me tell you about Akio Chisoji, <clears throat> director of. Uh, easily our favorite episodes of Ultraman um and also one kind of whatever episode of Ultraman um he's a I'm just gonna skip uh to oh he hasn't put <laughs> so of course Razan has not put any production notes Razan's production notes for episode 8 are just we are so fucking back <laughs> didn't need to say the name yeah um uh Jisoji's style instantly recognizable um i i should check again who wrote it though uh uh but you know well, well it might be his his guy yeah yeah i'm assuming that uh, but like uh we should we'll have a look yeah i'll do that but we'll you, you can do the summary first yeah um so let me take a drink the marked town the town of kitagawa has been struck by a series of mysterious deaths the most recent being Anne's uncle uh, while on patrol in Kitagawa, Furuhashi and Soga stop by a vending machine to pick up cigarettes and hear gunshots. Uh, a man with a rifle is shooting at people in the street. Furuhashi is injured, but the gunman is, em- is apprehended. Um, later, the shooter claims he remembers nothing of the incident, only that he, uh, before he blacked out, he was going to see a movie, and he picked up cigarettes from a vending machine by the station, and then he dropped by a gun shop he liked to hang out at. Dan feels like something's up, and his suspicion is confirmed when he is intercepted by a gravel truck with no driver, and a disembodied voice tells him not to interfere in Kitagawa. Uh, Back at base, Furuhashi smokes a cigarette from the pack he picked up at the vending machine and goes on a rampage. Uh, He is knocked out uh, by 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 the squad, and he is put in a hospital bed. Soga immediately smokes a cigarette from the same pack and goes on a rampage. Uh, Dan and the captain start to suspect that maybe this whole thing has something to do with cigarettes. Uh, It turns out there's space opium in them. That's not a joke. That's the plot of the show. There's space opium in the cigarettes. Uh, Anne and Dan visit Anne's relatives to find out if her uncle had also smoked the same cigarettes. It turns out, yes, he did. And they even managed to pin down where the cigarettes came from, a vending machine outside the station. Uh, Anne and Dan stake out the vending machine, and when someone refills it, they pursue them to a seemingly abandoned building. Uh, Dan enters alone and is confronted by the alien Metron, uh, who explains that there is no need to invade Earth. You simply have to erode the trust between human beings, and they will turn on each other. Metron has one last ace up his sleeve. He tricks Dan into chasing him onto a spaceship, which Metron then launches, trapping Dan. 
uh, the Ultra Guard launch and shoot down the spaceship, and Dan turns into Ultra Seven. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, he defeats the giant Metron in a sick battle at sunset. Uh, the narrator remarks that, yeah, uh, the narrator remarks that though destroying humanity might be as easy as eroding our trust, the audience shouldn't worry. This story surely takes place in the far, far future. Why? Well, because we don't trust each other enough yet for this plan to work. The end. Uh, cute punchline. Yeah. Uh, I think I heard um, like that was a, light, a later edition by Soji. That wasn't there okay. originally, but like... Uh. Okay. Um, Do we have confirmation on the writer? It's Tetsuo Kinjo, apparently. Ah, Which is okay. interesting because of the Mephilus connection, which I'll talk about in a bit. But yes. Let's talk about other stuff. This, this is a very Mephilus episode. Um. <coughs> so... Um, First of all, this episode looks amazing. Um, yeah. Because, also, I think uh, your, your summary probably also like skipped over a bunch of stuff just because like, of how oh, yeah, Soji yeah, yeah. is vibes in establishing shots. And like obviously, you know, for a summary, mm-hmm. we're not going to oh, talk yeah, about yeah, yeah. the letter, but we will talk about it here. The um, So the episode like opens uh, on like, it's a lot of just like, like so it opens on a... Uh, guy getting like caught by the police as uh, yeah, he, he chases down. He's yeah, chasing so, down so a woman. He's he's kidnapped a woman and she gets out of the car and like he chases her down and the police grab her. And all the while this is happening, like kids are watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it does have like a really jarring effect where like the kids are just like, "Well, that happened." Oh shit! It's the pointer as the ultra guard pops up. <laughs> oh yes, yes, that is really funny. Um, and uh, then it's uh dan attending like a funeral and yeah. um uh hearing like all the the citizens of kitagawa talking about how well you know the business is gonna be difficult what with all the deaths and yeah. um it feels like the town's cursed i gotta get out yeah um because there's like kind of thing. one of the kids like apparently his dad was a pilot and gone to a, an accident or something uh, mm-hmm. and like a bunch mm-hmm. of people died so and um it's all done very with like usual uh like jarring style um with like um action shot from like very far away and then um other stuff shot from like like alarmingly close yeah um, my note my note is like my my notes say uh right after the funeral's like this is where i realized this is just soji episode <laughs> yeah yeah um it's uh it's good uh the um the effect on I'm 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 skipping over stuff. We'll 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 go back. But the the effect on uh with the red light on um oh yeah Furuhashi and Soga uh is like really good. Yeah, I, really I cool. don't know what it is about it that makes it feel special because it's literally just they're shining a red light on him. But it feels so fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's good stuff. Um even funnier when you realize it's space opium it's literally space opium they take it apart and they go yeah it's this thing called space opium it's like is it <laughs> is that what it's called yeah they, um, they mentioned which pulls the, in they mentioned oh, the v3 space station again which is you know fun continuity mm-hmm. but yes they found which it i planet. which i of, i did not refer to it as the v3 space station i called it thunderbird 5 which is mean it's the v3 space station yeah Apparently they. Oh yeah, we found uh, space opium on planet Y somehow. So, mm-hmm. just just lore. If if you listen to this podcast enough, you I think you could figure out what the five Thunderbirds do, uh, just from uh, what I call Thunderbird one through five. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we've already had Thunderbird three and Thunderbird five this episode. Um, but um, yeah. The, uh, the, the space opium brings in, like, obviously, uh, Japan's relationship with opium, right? Um, and the, I, the history of that, the history of, like, go ahead. I actually wasn't sure how much opium was relevant to Japan. Like, obviously, it's a big deal for China, but... Yeah, it's a... Uh, Japan is, like, also kind of caught up in this. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I feel like, it, I, like it's, it's... I don't think... I don't think there are wars in the way that yeah, there are yeah, in yeah. China. <laughs> Like I, I, uh, I can't imagine it wasn't affecting them, but it's just the way. I don't know, complicated. Hmm. Mm. Um. It's like you know. Uh. 
there is, I don't know enough about it, uh, but uh, there is like some um, stuff involving um, uh, Westerners, you know, Western powers pushing opium, um, which like in, you know, the context of like an, uh, an Ultraman, you get into, obviously you get into uh, like uh, the like fundamental like uh, nationalism that is sometimes in like uh, uh, the anime and toku, I guess, mm-hmm. um, also. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's I I don't think that um, you know the it, it's not like it's it, it's not like it's uh, not to be dismissive of the of the thing because like obviously uh, it's you know the history is real <laughs> the the thing that is being criticized is real um so uh the the whole thing like pushing like obviously this is this, this plot doesn't actually bear much resemblance to actual opium <laughs> no no which is the thing which is why it's only like like tangentially relevant um really um yo it's read from the future uh, remember I said I had to correct myself? Uh, well, I'm not super familiar with Japan's history with opium, but I knew about Britain and China and opium, and had just kind of figured that everyone in East Asia got caught in this. Uh, for some reason, I had not made the obvious connection between opium and the existence of the Japanese Empire. Uh, and then last night I saw a Wikipedia article titled, Japanese Opium Policy in Taiwan, and I was like, Oh, right, of course. That makes sense. Um, I'm recording this the morning this episode comes out, so I only had time to do a little reading. Specifically, I skimmed through some sections of a book called Opium Regimes, China, Britain, and Japan, 1839 to 1952, by Timothy Brooke and Bob Tadashi Wakabayashi. Broadly, in the Edo period, having seen the effects of opium in Qing China, Japan managed to pretty effectively outlaw opium before it was a big problem. Then the Meiji era hit, and the Empire kicked in, and the predictable happened. Uh, Just going to directly quote from the introduction uh, to the book, which is just a concise summary of the arguments the authors go on to make. Uh, As Imperial Britain extricated itself from the 19th century opium regime it had operated in China, Imperial Japan began to assemble its own. Japan's first colonial experience with an opium regime was in Taiwan, where it began a successful program to control addiction after occupying the island in 1895. With their expansion to the Asian mainland, first to Korea and then to Manchuria, Japanese discovered the irresistible power of opium to generate capital. Imperial Japanese subjects were smuggling opium into China as early as the 1890s, but the nature and scale of their activities began to change decisively during the interwar period, when first the great Saibatsu corporations and then the imperial government itself smuggled not just opium, but refined drugs, first morphine, then heroin. Then, skipping a little bit about the League of Nations being useless, classic stuff, uh, the importance of opium in Japan's calculations increased exponentially during its Asia-Pacific War, uh, particularly in the early phases. Japanese opium operations in China sprang from three motives. First, Opium-funded undercover operations that facilitated aggression against Chinese territory outside of Japan's control. Second, opium profits went to right-wing societies in Japan, and there is some evidence linking laundered wartime opium monies with post-war conservative parties. Finally, and above all, the Japanese imperial government needed to finance a series of increasingly expensive client states in occupied China, Opium seemed the only expeditious way to do this. The fact that Imperial Japan would happily adopt the methods of Western empires is something that I know, yet somehow this particular detail, just about opium, uh, never occurred to me. Very embarrassing. Anyway, now to ask a ridiculous question. Uh, What does all of this mean for episode 8 of Ultra 7? Well... I don't fucking know. Here's the thing. Yeah, Japan's history with opium is a history of Japanese imperialism, so this episode about an alien pushing space opium on people looks less like the traditional kind of nationalist anti-American narrative that I have described. Uh, but I removed just the word opium from the script for a second, <clears throat> and the substance of the episode is about Japan getting hooked on dangerous cigarettes by an alien power, and 
this is the thing. This is the, the tobacco is the thing. Tobacco was a Western import that at times in Japan's history, the government tried and failed to outlaw. Um, the aesthetic is playing with the subject of Western influence in Japan. Even in like uh, the scene where Dan explains the villain's plan to Anne, they're drinking Coca-Cola, right? Um, but it's the word opium. You can't just scrub it. I don't know. This episode suddenly has just bizarre vibes. I can't like i can't it's it's tricky um good episode but it's bizarre um all right i think i've overstayed my welcome i'm gonna be reading this book at some point it's pretty interesting uh i hope you enjoy the rest of the episode uh bye bye but uh the uh the effect of the drugs uh, the effect of, op of space opium is that it makes you see everyone as an enemy um and it makes you attack them and uh, you don't necessarily remember that you've attacked them. Um, and then afterwards, you know, you either fall unconscious or you die. Um, and uh, the, like, investigation of this is, like, it's, like, uh, proper, like, kind of procedural stuff. Um, it's uh, attending, like, yeah, an interrogation. So I'm gonna get, I'll, I'll talk about a bit more production side of this episode because like I wanted to get more stuff about this episode specifically. Uh, mm -hmm. One note I have is that like there's like the first time except for I guess maybe episode one where we see people of the Ultra Guard in the civilian uniform because like obviously Dan comes in in jeans and stuff but like this scene this episode we get like Dan and Anne doing like a stakeout and they're also in civilian uniforms instead of Ultra Guard uniforms which is like mm -hmm. they're almost always in the uniform. And yeah. that's true in Ultraman too, in a lot of ways. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just neat. It's just nice. You know? Yeah, it's cool. It is. And uh, but yeah, like you say, there's the there's the stakeout as well as like proper. It's like they um, figure out what the problem is, and then they uh, they you know go to Anne's relatives and they like questions like, okay, uh, did he smoke? It's like yes, he smoked. Um, did he buy the cigarettes? Uh, on the day and the kid is like his like uh the uncle's like son uh and nephew is like yeah uh you know he his normal shop was closed um and you know they get the kid to, to remember where they bought the cigarettes they go to them they find it's empty they stake it out wait for someone to refill it um it's just like proper police procedural stuff um which is you know cool it's cool to get in the show i you know uh, i uh, i like that kind of show um also 50 percent of people smoke cigarettes what the fuck <laughs> that's crazy i i mean it's the 60s i, I don't I, know I, I on the one on, I, like, like i was I taken like, aback by the statistic i was like that can't be true yeah, like, obviously it was we higher and more normalized in the 50s and 60s but also just like holy shit <laughs> it feels unthinkable in these days you know and maybe that's now, just like maybe that's just the, culture changing. is it is it dinosaur science or is it real um uh, what percentage of people smoked in the 60s um, okay, in 1964, 40% of Americans were regular smokers. Um, might, might be worth checking Japanese statistics, too. Yeah. What percentage of... I know Japan still, like, a place where smoking is, like, like still way more common. Yeah. Um, I said in the, in the 60s. I don't mean today. Oh, this is this is the prop. This is the problem with just like I said. Uh, all these statistics are about how Japan is still like smoking central. <laughs> um, how come we're smoking? Uh, no, that's about America. No, uh, I would have to do a, a more thorough look. Uh, but uh, oh, when did smoking become popular in Japan? Uh, during rationing times in World War II, the government allowed up to three cigarettes per man per day, and this rationing continued until 1950. Lifting the rations led to the number of male smokers in Japan <laughs> in 1966, jumping to 83.7%. <laughs> Bro, holy shit. Yo. That's crazy. Holy fuck. If that's real, uh, let me have a look uh, at this website, see if it looks uh, vaguely trustworthy. This is... Uh, uh, isanow.com um, dot com. Um, no idea what their source is on this. Oh, they have a source. Hang on. Okay. 
Okay, their source is another article. I, I don't know how real this is, but um, it's a number I've seen. There we go. I've said it out loud on a podcast now, so it has to be real. That's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, wax house, baby. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, um, yeah, 50... So, they say, like, 50% of people uh, are global, are smokers. Um, and, like, you know this plan therefore given that that statistic is obviously true um this plan will tear apart humanity once it's made like once it's broadened out to the whole world um and metron you know the confrontation between ultra 7 and metron i was about to call him ultra man again i'll confess uh between ultra 7 and metron is like uh dan rocks up and metron's there is like yeah sure come on in Let's have yeah. a chat. This this set uh, table and it's cool. It just it is cool, cool vibes. They just in, in the, there's a rundown apartment just lived in, mm-hmm. and they're just chilling. It's uh, it's like you said relevant that uh, <clears throat> the Mephless vibes uh, are real. Yeah, and Rosin brings this up too. Um, mm-hmm. In his notes, and just, me, yeah, let me. Can, let me consult Razness. Yes, I'll, I'll look back to the Mephiles stuff after we do this, just because it comes up. Uh, we are so fucking back. We are so fucking back. Return of the King. Um, just so you time. Uh, this is the most effective anti-smoking PSA I've ever seen. Damn straight. Uh, this episode reminded me of a series of Japanese venting machine poisonings that sometimes get covered in true crime uh, uh, circles. So much so that I double-checked the dates and was surprised to learn that the episode predates it by a few decades. Um... Paraquat murders. Okay. Yeah. Um, that alien is a hot dog. Okay, I need to have a look at this alien again. Alien Metron. Well, I mean, he's not wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just a bit. He's a bit of a hot dog. Um, okay. Uh, it feels like a lot of other writers were inspired by the Mephiles episode from the last show. We're getting a lot of aliens characterized the same way. Yeah. Incredible episode. Yeah, I yeah. do want to um, say that's probably might be true, but also... The fact that that episode was written by Tetsuo Kinjo, and it seems like a lot of episodes in the seven we've gotten so far are also written by Kinjo, so I think it might just be... It's it's his taste. It's We're his getting taste. his taste. And I'm going to be real. I approve. It's good. I approve. Um, it's, a, you know, the, the, it's a good taste to want the aliens to chat with Ultraman. And just, just Ultra on seven. the point, Fuck. one thing that, like, was a common thread I also saw in the Mephilus and this one was just, like... There's a part where, like, Metron uses the truck uh, to stop Dan and tells mm-hmm. him, like, hey, now, don't don't interfere. We're both aliens here. Uh, yes, uh, we and, don't, yes. And that just reminded me of, like, you know, the way Mephilus is, like, a, you know, Ultraman, we're both aliens, we don't fight. And I think this idea of, like, shared... I, I feel like the idea of a shared alien identity is weird. Because, like, mm-hmm. it doesn't really make sense to be, like, oh, all of the other aliens in the universe have, like, a non-Earth identity. But also, I... Like, like even like even in their relationship with each other, the, the identity is, we're not from Earth. Yeah, but on the other hand, um, from the context of, like, you know, we are both aliens in relation to Earth specifically, and we're doing Earth... Mm-hmm. We're doing stuff to Earth. Maybe it makes it more sense, just because I, I, my brain goes to, mm-hmm. like, the sort of gentleman's agreement the European powers had in dividing up Africa, where they're like, oh, hey, we're all white people here. We can... We, do, yeah, we, we, we can all... We can all... We can all be friends. Like, they're not... They, yeah. weren't, they weren't fighting wars in Africa until World War I, um, mm-hmm. until they'd already divided things up amongst each other. Uh, imperialism. So, yeah, I, um, I guess I guess that... Yeah, that, that does... So, I'm, uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering whether... Yeah. What... Because, you know, so Kinjo being like okinawa and that came up in the, some of his like mm-hmm. thought process for the methyl episode i wonder how much that in, informs his idea of like aliens and like yeah. how they interact him, with each other versus humans um, mm-hmm. him being kind of like a yeah um a subject of like you know yeah. kind of a kind of a subject of japanese occupation to an extent yeah i feel like that has to come um, into it on you and you know yeah. Okinawa being like conquered and, then, and occupied by Japan, the and then, relationship with Okinawa and Ryukyu and identity versus within, and it's sort of like denial and 
Japanese. Yeah, and then but also and then like subsequent America. Yeah, because like yeah, is, yeah America American occupation of Okinawa. Yeah, because America occupies Japan and like Okinawa is like the last the bastion, base. and it's where all okay, yeah. So it's like mm-hmm. double occupation. <laughs> the, the layers of occupation happening here are you know. It's a yeah, lot. so I can I can def I can definitely see uh, uh, Kinjo's relationship to that like influencing. Yeah. Um, how he writes uh, aliens in yeah. ultra in ultra. Inc- incidentally, my friend <clears throat> told me that like it's a similar thing with shows at Uruhara as well. Like he's also Okinawa, and so that comes into his writing as well. So that's interesting. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the sunset is fucking cool. The sunset and is cool. It's interesting that like I see the sunset, and like I could tell while I was watching that like that is a fake sun. It's a but it's also, a glowing ball. <laughs> but also, it's very effective. Uh, yeah, it's a very it's a very like uh, I want to say it's a it's a daring special effect because it's it's very obviously not real. Yeah, <laughs> it's um, like, but it's uh, it works. Yeah, and I also just like you know we're talking about the the livedness of the neighborhood they go to in the building, and having that clash with like the spaceship opening in the <laughs> the closet and then like the the, the mm-hmm. apartment opens up and the spaceship comes out is very cool yeah it's fantastic like the the moment he stepped into the um like the control room and then we cut to outside and i'm suddenly looking at a little model set i'm like oh this is the f- this this is why i watch this show this show's fucking cool yeah it's, <laughs> it's like the, there's a spaceship about to erupt out of the top of that out of the top of that building yeah. uh it's fantastic this these are Ultra 7 is excelling over Ultraman for sure. Just, mm-hmm. I think he, he allows for more set pieces like this specifically. Yeah. Um, mm. Anyway, yeah. Good. Yeah. Good episode. I want to give some background stuff uh, that I found in the Utopia blog that I'll link in the description below. Uh, Hit me. Apparently, this was much like the quote unquote spoon incident, another case where. Soji what? was getting into trouble <laughs> with people or TBS. What was he getting into trouble about? Apparently, there was some sort of rule because they wanted the show to have a Western appeal and to have like this futurism to it. They're like, not have the show be too overtly Japanese. Uh, and uh, wow. this episode has a whole lot of here is just a Japan, <laughs> here is a rundown yeah. neighborhood where a baseball ra- is playing on the radio in the background, <laughs> and it's just uh apparently Damn. tbs didn't like this uh and i'm gonna break some hearts here apparently they liked they they were they may have been so upset with this that uh they sent jisoji off to kyoto to work on period dramas for a bit so there's a gap of ultra seven where he's just not working on it no <laughs> jisoji oh but also apparently they brought him back because he's like a pe- because he's like the story guy and not the special effects guys his episodes are also less expensive <laughs> which is really oh, funny <laughs> they send him away and immediately they're like oh fuck we sent away the guy that's cheap <laughs> uh i i love this like i wish he would you know, stop saying that he's we're gonna be missing him for a bit but it's so it's so it's like almost like like obviously i like the rest of the show it is almost insulting that jisoji is the cheap one <laughs> and like, like the reason he's cheap is because he like he focuses on like the cinematography and like yeah. on the character talking about stuff and like the writing instead of like and, the set pieces like Super Hajime Sobrai does and like you know the big and yet things. and yet the set piece at the end of this episode is fantastic easily more memorable than a lot of others <laughs> it's um it's not fair <laughs> yeah But yeah, um, yeah, we, I swear for next week, we will get one more thing by him. Uh, oh, we, sick. But we won't, we won't uh, see him for a bit. For a while. That's okay. I it's space. If, if we space him out, he's a treat. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how much it would, it would be, it would be, uh, it would be too great a wish, um, to get like a whole show <laughs> that was just, just Soji. <laughs> Yeah, it would have been, been cool. 
I mean, it, really it would be pleasant, cool, pleasant. but also it would, be, it he, wouldn't, he, it would, yeah. He does have the Ultra Q movie on his bill, so it's oh, gonna be so good. I can't wait. <laughs> I, I can't like, wait. I'm so excited for that. Uh, God damn. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, I you know I do wish more people were like just Soji and just being like, yeah, here's just they're staking out. They're in civilian clothing. And I mean, we do get a rundown neighborhood in like the next episode too, but you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a little more cartoony. Yeah. Um. All right. Speaking of next episode. Yeah. Uh, we have to move on to episode nine. Uh, which is called now. Is it called Android Command Zero or Android Operation Zero? Android Directive Zero. Directive. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> god damn um okay there we go directive zero all right episode nine android directive zero while on patrol a strange woman stops furuhashi and asks if he is moroboshi dan furuhashi decides to borrow dan's riz and says "Uh, yeah I'm Moroboshi. Uh, and then the woman attempts to shock him to death with a brooch that has an insignia on it. Um, instant, instant justice. Uh, Furuhashi survives and the Ultra Guard have a case to crack. Uh, the next day, Dan and Soga find a bunch of kids playing in the streets with guns that look pretty real. Uh, all the guns have the insignia on them and the kids all wear the insignia as a patch. Uh, they got the toys and the patches from an old toy maker who, to me looks like Japanese Michael Palin, uh, who is one of the Monty Python guys. Oh. Uh, I'm I'm not like a I'm not like a Monty Python fan or anything, but like um Michael Michael Palin uh Red insisting I'm not British. Just because I'm British doesn't mean (laughs) Just because I'm British doesn't mean I'm British. (laughs) Just because I'm British doesn't mean I'm capital B British. Uh, let me post this guy. Um, there was just oh. like some close, <laughs> some close up of him, uh, of the of the toy maker at some point, and I was like, this this this, this guy this guy looks a lot like Michael Palin. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyway. Uh. So. <clears throat> where was I? Michael Palin. The toy maker sees the Ultra Guard snooping around and wheels his cart back home in a hurry. Uh, the Ultra Guard investigate one of the patches uh, and find it has a radio receiver in it. Uh, the toy maker deploys a puppet, the strange woman who attacked Furuhashi, uh, to lure Moroboshi Dan into a trap. Uh, at night, Dan and Soga chase the puppet into a toy shop and are ambushed by the toy maker, who explains his plan. Android Directive Zero will commence at midnight, when hypnosis signals will be sent to the kids wearing patches. Uh, under hypnosis, the children will enable their toy guns which are in fact very real and more dangerous than any weapon on earth, and they will take over the world from all the helpless adults who will not dare to shoot on children. I have bad news for this guy. This world is not a very nice place. (laughs) I bet. Uh, They're a... IBO voice. We can kill wicked children. Guilty Uh... children. (laughs) Um... Soga laughs at the idea of toys that are weapons, and the toy maker springs the trap. Uh, the toys in the shop come to life and start attacking Soga and Dan. Uh, Dan calls for backup and knocks Soga unconscious so he can turn into Ultra Seven. Uh, he destroys the puppet, and the toy maker turns into his uh, alien form, which Ultra Seven easily dispatches with his head beam. Yeah, um, I spe- he spent too long uh, working out at the library. Yeah. Um. Midnight comes and goes with little incident. Uh, the world is saved. The end. I didn't get your library joke. Oh, it's because his brain is big. His brain is huge. This this is true. <laughs> it's got a huge brain. I saw this guy and instantly thought of like um, Halo engineers. Um, uh, so uh, well, I also well, I also thought uh, those are some. Um, uh, semi-perfect cell lips. <laughs> there's some, there's some air. Eh. Uh, but um, otherwise, a pretty cool design. 
Um, the uh, So this episode, what my summary did not get across at all, is that everything from the moment that the... Uh, that Dan and Soga walk into a toy shop at night. Everything from then on is really cool. Oh, <laughs> just yeah, looks just... and feels sick. Yeah, it's cool vibes, good energy. It's uh, it's lots of creeping through just quiet, um, quiet hallways. There is a like, there's like a mannequin jump scare where um, uh, Soga thinks he's been attacked by the woman, but it's just it's a mannequin. Um, Must be said about on, you know, how nice the, a puppet. the nice the night shots in the show are, and that we're getting them. Yes, they really are. Um, they're they're doing good work. Um, the uh, the moment that like the ambush is triggered and like all the little tanks and planes come to life and yeah. start attacking Dan and Soga is uh, uh, Hajime Subaraya levels of. Um, absolutely burning money <laughs> yeah uh i do you know just on that just because we're on that note uh this episode is cool to me in a similar way to in like an inverse way as like big ipe and big fuji where it's like yes it's like instead of like oh we have the big set and we have like a normal person walk through it they're like we have the miniatures and we're having them through like a normal set with like the normal size people yeah uh yeah it's it's cool. It's a it's a it's a good choice. It's it, it works. It's good. Um, uh, the um, the the moment that he explains his plan and it like uh, the camera comes around him and like they edit in like all the kids marching and like none of them can resist looking directly at the camera <laughs> is really funny. Uh, working with children, everybody. <laughs> Um, working with guilty children yeah yeah guilty children <laughs> <laughs> i need to i need to rewatch ibo uh yeah ibo is good uh that guy rules he sucks so much <laughs> <laughs> that, that's uh, ma- many such gundam characters <laughs> many many such cases <laughs> oh jared oh perfect perfect man <laughs> terrible um the um uh yeah there's, there's not like a lot to be said for this episode beyond yeah. um uh the, at- the atmosphere good um there's uh you know what let me pull up browsing notes. furuhashi and soga continue to be one guy split into two people and must be they are what they are yes they are they are divided at birth uh one guy um they got a uh i I did i did like uh furuhashi uh getting owned immediately the moment the episode happens it was good um they brought they they were like we need someone to get owned so who from ultraman will we bring back well we'll bring back the guy that played arashi uh, so I pull up Brazen's notes uh, instead of me struggling to think of something to say uh, <coughs> excuse me <coughs> uh, this episode also feels very ultra Q uh, they're doing a good job of integrating the horror and the mystery of that show with uh, the alien fighting science fiction formula of Ultraman um, yeah I, I I would say that this is uh like, I could see this being the plot of an Ultra Q episode. Um, and, you know, we we could say that for a lot of episodes in Ultra 7 so far. Um, uh, Razan says, I do wish that we had space for episodes Ayo. where the villain is just... Oh, are you back? Oh, I was, I, I was just saying Ao because he said space. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> for a moment there, I thought you'd disconnected and come back. <laughs> Uh, I do wish that we had space, Ao, uh, for episodes where the villain is just a regular human up to no good and not an alien in disguise. Yeah, I, I, uh, I just think that's not the show. As much as I think that I, would be more interesting, uh, it would. But I, just, it, I don't think it's gonna happen. Like, I think this is just like not what they're interested in. They're like, this is the cool alien 
So. This is the voice of the Mysterons. Yeah. Um, uh, fun episode. I feel like Kazuo Mitsuta is really nailing it on this show so far. Spoilers for the production notes directed by Kazuho uh, Mitsuta. Um, I, yeah, very impressive, uh, this episode. Um, very good work. Uh, I'm, you know, glad to have him on board. And there we go. Doing a good job. Written by, hey, here he is, Shota Uhara. Yeah, who uh, wrote the Bostang episode, which is the the episode where Ultraman gets invented. Uh, Statue of Goga. <clears throat> oh, that's the real highlight. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Monster Anarchy Zone. <laughs> and like uh, that last Thunderbirds episode with the on a planet yeah, in Ultraman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that one's all right. On, on that note, I do want to say, <laughs> seeing that shows that Urhara wrote this episode, I do see the plot of this episode and go... Oh, yeah, this is absolutely a Super Sentai episode. <laughs> but just, just, oh, the, there's a, the alien, the, there's a villain handing out weird things with, to kids and going to, uh, use it to unleash a plan. <laughs> that's just like, <laughs> that's Sentai. That's, that's the Sentai episode. vibe. That's <laughs> just like exactly okay. the under there. Uh, Fantastic. Just, you know, I can see it. I can see the through line slowly. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, I think the, the, uh, I think, you know, obviously it's fun to target kids in the kids show, uh, it's good, um, uh, you know, excuse, excuse to, uh, put children on screen, uh, in for your family show, right, you know, get the kids involved, um, and, uh, it is funny that the plot is kind of like uh, oh, kids pl- oh, kids playing with guns. <laughs> it's like got mild um, you be on that phone vibes, um, but for the equivalent back in back in the sixties. I I do feel um, like uh, the way those guns sounded. I'm like, damn, would people actually buy this? Because this just sounds obnoxious to have around all the time. <laughs> uh, you didn't own incredibly obnoxious Star Wars blasters then. <laughs> no. I, no, I didn't. I had, I had a... I don't know if it was a Han Solo one or if it was something. Um, and it had two sounds. Uh, and that was it. <laughs> and I... It, the, the noise around the house would just be me pulling the trigger over and over again for <laughs> ages. And it was just like, oh man, that must have been fucking grating. <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, there were no capsule monsters this week. Two weeks in a row. I'm getting owned. Yeah. I, made, I, can't, I thought I had a nice bit. Turns out. Turns out. No. No, you don't. They took away your color timer. Uh, and they took, they, you know, they teased you with Pokemon. And now it's not real. It's not in the it's show a, anymore. It's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll probably get Color Timers back next season. <laughs> I, I, I suspect that in the show, The Return of Ultraman, yes, we will get the Color Timer back. Uh, it's all right. At some point, I'll probably do some digging to see what was up with the Capsule Monsters if they end up being more of a non-thing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny how much, like, you know, fundamentally the formula is kind of the same as Ultraman. But the show is so wildly different from Ultraman um, in so many ways uh, that it's it's strange. Like the you know, obviously the color the color timer is kind of like a superficial um, uh, change, but it like suggests like a like a like a deeper change in terms of like what the emphasis is on. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, you can feel it in the show. It's um. Ultra Seven is much, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Obviously, it's it's still a kids show, but like it's it's not. But also, it's not remember, constant. They yeah. they are gonna start at some point. Knowing their audience is actually more full of adults, they're gonna start shifting towards that because we're still in the mm-hmm. first uh, batch. Yeah, we still got thirteen. Our yeah. first thirteen. So. Hmm. Anyway, uh, do we have anything more to say about Episode Nine, Android Directive Zero? 
No, nah. no, nah, I think I think I covered it. Like I think the episode with the most to talk about was episode eight. <clears throat> Funny that. Funny. Weird coincidence. Whoa, whoa. Who, who would have thought? Yeah. Who who could have foreseen this? Um, well, uh, on that note, no capsule, no capsules. Yeah. So we can go straight into. Oh, do we have any? Do we have any? Yeah, I just check. We got none. None this week. Okay, that is fine. Um, I can go straight into plugs. If you want to follow the show, you can do so at ultra underscore Q on Twitter. That is at ultra underscore Q U E U E. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at gender underscore redacted. Um, forgive my meltdown last week. Uh, I, you know, uh, people keep retweeting my Gundam tweets. I don't know why. <laughs> They're not that good. Uh, Mel. Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Dear Crowns. Some other places too. The same thing. Whatever. Uh, we got our email altcupod at gmail.com. Uh, send in if you have any thoughts on the show. We have a tip jar, coffee, altq fund. I'm trying to get those more shows prolong the life of the podcast on life support. Mm-hmm. Forcing these people to watch more <laughs> Ultraman as it gets yeah, more it's so at risk. Ra- it's so at risk right now. <laughs> We're really running out of stuff. <laughs> uh, I just like to be a completionist. Um, uh, of course, of course. Uh, do you have anything? Oh yeah, the YouTube. Uh, Alt Q. You might be listening to this on YouTube anyway. Uh, I was like, hey, if you like the show, tell people. Never said that before, but you know. Uh, no, it's a secret. Don't tell anyone. Like, comment, and subscribe. I'm never doing that. Never. Uh, <laughs> you just did it. You, oh, you break, man, you break I, a I, promise. I did the, I did the thing where uh, I make fun of doing it, but then I also do it. Yeah. Which makes it good. Classic. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that that's what makes it fine. Yeah. Also, uh, he will be here next week, but he's not here this week. But, you know, Razin is at, at Razin Brad on Twitter and on YouTube. Yeah. Return of Razin Brad is next week return of ultraman is several weeks from now. yeah uh like three months i suppose that's more than several <laughs> i mean more than several weeks how much is several it's like is there like a set amount it's gotta be like i don't know like like five to eight seems like a good amount i guess three months is about eight weeks it's like eight twelve weeks Something like that. Anyway, uh, that's the show. We're done here. Yeah. Uh, join us next time for three more episodes yes. of Ultra 7. Yes, and uh, just a note. Next week, 10, 11, and 12. 12 is the, yes, the band the episode. the missing episode. The missing episode. It's not okay. on the official release, uh, but you can find it Fantastic. elsewhere. But we are covering it. And <clears throat> if you want to watch it, because we, we will be doing that, you know, look, look in the places. Am I allowed to know why it's banned yet, or or is that, We're gonna is that talk after we watch it? Okay, cool. All right. Um, join us next time for that. Uh, see ya. Bye bye.
Love.